Welcome back to our Not A Director's Cut series. It's time to start season three. Can you actually believe it? This series where we provide commentary on every single episode of Knight Rider has proven to be quite popular with you guys. In fact, here's a few quick stats. All right, we've done two seasons already. 41 commentary episodes. Over 630,000 combined views. Wow. I am so humbled that you guys continue to like hearing my sweet, sweet voice each week. Today, it's all about the supersized episode, Night of the Drones. And this commentary episode is supersized as well. We've got so, so much to cover. Possibly more to cover than any previous commentary episode. Check this out. We're going to cover the following. An interview with someone who has a very special connection to this episode and actually watched it being filmed in 1984. Plus, see the really cool piece he saved from the set. It's nothing you would ever think of. We're going to dissect the opening intro from this episode. A one episode only opening intro and only on the original NBC airing. You'll get to see the very, very cool 1900-210 kit promo commercial and you're going to hear the actual phone recording of Kit from 1984. I don't think this has ever been published before. We're going to cover the crazy bullet-inspired car chase through the streets of San Francisco that we see in this episode. And of course, we'll completely overanalyze the entire two-hour episode. So, whether you're a prison guard that just led a dangerous criminal back on the streets, one half of a bodybuilding team that moonlights as a minion for evildoers in the Golden City, or a nice elderly couple just trying to get around town. Our maps! Our maps! Sit back, let the drone car chauffeur you around while we dig into Night of the Drones. Sunday on a two-hour Night Rider, Kit gets an eyeful of a shapely sharpshooter with some hidden assets. But can he survive a hit from this miss? Sunday. Tonight, this is it. The two-hour movie premiere of Night Rider that shows all of Kit's new superpowers. All right, pal. It's all new adventure as Kit and Michael dodge deadly drones. Dangerous doubles. Beautiful villains. I can't look. I want him killed. It's the all-new two-hour premiere. That's all we need. Of Night Rider. Right. Hi everyone, my name is Tyler Hamm, and back in 1984, they shot some of the Margot's home, Margot's house sequences uh, at my house in Tiburon, California for the Knight Rider episode, Night of the Drones. Um, that was actually sort of the reason that I eventually ended up getting into the film industry after watching that for several days. Uh, it was just fascinating because I was such a Knight Rider fan before that and seeing how it was actually put together and meeting everyone sort of is what inspired a lot of my, my future career. Um, so why they picked that house at the time, uh, it's no secret, but for that season of Knight Rider, there was actually a writer's strike going on in Los Angeles and they had to start shooting in other locations. And that's why Night of the Drones takes place near San Francisco. The, uh, the episode after Night of the Drones is also a San Francisco episode. Um, so my house was located in a town called uh, Tiburon, which is right across the bay from San Francisco. The actual address of that house was 20 Place Mulan, and that was sort of a, uh, I guess finding that location was sort of a mystery for a couple years for the Knight Rider location fans. So um, for context, uh, that house was kind of ideal for a production like Knight Rider because Place Mulan was sort of a street off of a street off of a street. It was really private. Uh, my dad actually built that house. Uh, he was a builder. He built that house in 1978. And there were really no neighbors. It was the end of a long street in cul-de-sac. So there was no, you know, no worrying about houses being blocked. Um, no real worry about complaints from neighbors. It was very, very private. No looky-loos. You know, no one, no one came up to watch 
the shooting. And it was also convenient because uh, uh, Place Milan was part of a street called Sugarloaf, which dead ended into a street uh, called Lyford. And Lyford dead ended uh, as well into open space. And my grandparents actually owned the house on Lyford that dead ended into this open space. And so they didn't have to get extra permission from anyone to block my grandparents' house in. And so they set up all the catering and all the craft services down there. And then it was just a short um, little ride up to the actual shooting location. Um, I don't I don't know the specifics about how they got my parents' address for this. I do remember as a kid, I mean, granted, I was only seven years old at the time. Uh, as a kid, uh, I remember them shooting, uh, occasionally commercials would be shot at that house. The only one I really remember was for, um, it was a credit card company. Um, I think it was American Express and uh, starring Roy Jacuzzi of Jacuzzi tub, hot tub fame. And so I think it was just sort of on, it must have been on some list of potential homes to be used for these kind of things. And how I found out was we were actually on a family vacation and my dad had to leave early and I didn't know why. Uh, he left a couple days early and then uh, it was just, just my mom and dad and I. I didn't have any siblings at that point. And so my mom and I packed up and as we drove home, my mom turned and said, there's a surprise when you get home, they're filming an episode of Knight Rider at our house. And I, I lost it. I mean, it was like a three hour car ride that felt like two weeks. And when I got there, I had missed, uh, they were there for four days total and I missed the beginning of day one. Uh, but when I got there, uh, that big uh, Rolls Royce that pulls into the house in the episode was just sitting in the, in the driveway. And I thought, okay, the, the, this is amazing. And of course, the first thing I wanted to do being a fan was go find David Hasselhoff. You know, uh, Hoff was great. He was awesome the whole time. Uh, I, I've often been asked about this, you know, like wh how how was he? And I, w I was just a goofy little kid. I mean, I have my photo of him here. You know, I know I was one of these kids that it was like, I want to take a thousand shots with you, you know? So we have, you know, if you can see just all of these, and I bookmarked some of the other shots. There's me and Kit. I was really upset that Kit didn't talk. Uh, I remember sitting in there and one of the PAs or something said, you know, spider, spider, looking for spider. And I was like, that's not Kit's voice. And that, that, so that was kind of a bummer. Um, he was great. There's more pictures that kind of show how great he was, really. I don't know if I would have been as great to an overly starstruck uh, seven-year-old. In fact, um, you know, really, everyone was great. I have more photos. Uh, so I met all the actors in that episode. The one I didn't get to meet was the actor whose name I, I can't remember. And I don't remember why he wasn't there. Uh, who plays the safe cracker and uh which is interesting because later in life i realized that's the same actor uh, who was in kentucky fried movie in the uh, in the bruce lee um sort of parody so that would have been kind of fun like just as like a later life thing uh so here i am with uh clifton and turk the barbarian brothers uh this was the second uh second unit he was the stunt um stunt director that's kind of a fun fact. So Margo, it's my first kiss right there. Little kid. Yeah, I, I peaked at seven in that regard. Uh, and here I am with uh, with Jim Brown, which kind of looking back now, you know, that's uh, it's Jim Brown. Like as a kid, I only cared about David Hasselhoff, but and I didn't even realize like arguably the greatest NFL player of all time is, <laughs> is, is, is here for three days. And uh, I was unfortunately a little dismissive because you know he wasn't he wasn't Michael Knight um you know as far as me being a, a, an annoying little kid you know I kind of paparazzi paparazzi Hoff the whole time I just had one of these like little garbagey little cameras and as you can see there's a lot of like kid perspective photos just just hiding and taking shots you know and he was really cool I have some more pics here like he actually kind of kind of got into it like he would he would kind of ham it up for me you know he, he took a you know an old you know, how many people have a selfie with with Hoff from 1984 you know he, he would just kind of goof around with me you know just could not have been nicer as far as like funny stories there's uh the production was just incredible like um 
as a kid, I'm sure I was annoying everyone. Uh, one kind of funny story that I, I like to tell was, uh, so the, the house, everything was kind of circular, like every room sort of led into another room. And so they were shooting a scene in what was our dining room. And they were shooting from the front and I didn't know where they were. And I came in through a back door that was cracked open. I saw they were shooting and then I jumped and hid behind some curtains. And I just stood there and stood there and stood there. It felt like it was 10 minutes. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, kid time and all. But then uh, they wrapped the scene and I hear someone yell, oh my God, there's a kid behind the curtain. And so I just ran back out like like they wouldn't know it was me, the only kid on, on the crew. Um, another fun scene, which actually got cut, I, but I remember being fascinated by this, was when the Barbarian Brothers, when Clifton and Turk are holding on to the, uh, the gate and uh, Michael and Kit electrocute the gate. And so they're, they're standing there and they're shaking. Originally, that scene had tubes down the guy's uh, shirts and they were gonna start smoking. And they actually ended up, I have a picture of that, but they actually ended up not using this version of it because uh, the smoke didn't really show up. And, uh, you know, they had a hard time because they're in such, I mean, they're in like kind of small unitards almost. And they couldn't hide the the um, tubing enough and the smoke just, the effect just didn't really work on camera. Um, so one of the things uh, I get asked sometimes too is they say, uh, you know, what did they change? Uh, what of the stuff in that house was yours? What did they bring in? And actually, uh, they changed nothing. I mean, so when, and that's kind of cool for me because if I kind of want to go down memory lane of the house I was literally born in, we moved into that house when I was a few months old and we, we moved out probably two years after filming. So I was about 10. And so I, that's the most time I've really ever spent in one house. Uh, it's a really kind of a fun thing for me to just put on just to be nostalgic about the house I grew up in. But really all the stuff like, the, the, you know, when Hoff walks in that front door, all of the paintings, decorations, where everything was, like they didn't move anything. And in fact, when we watched the episode, I remember, uh, cause when uh, Hoff walks into Margot's house and he kind of goes and he looks at one of the walls and he says something along the lines of like, nice house, just the right amount of pretentiousness. I remember my dad thinking that was really funny because like, <laughs> it's literally him talking about my dad's things. And so, uh, you know, that to this day, you know, just a couple months ago, I put it on kind of just reminisce because, you know, my, my, my dad's no longer with us. And it's kind of fun looking back. And in fact, uh, I noticed the other day on the last viewing that uh, after that pretentiousness part, uh, Hoff's care, well, Michael Knight, wants to go another part of the house. So he kind of does a, a hard right through a door. And that would have passed what was our kitchen into the living room uh, for that house. And the door to the right of that door he goes through was a bathroom and there's a wall in between and there's a horse painting on that wall I noticed. And I actually have that horse painting in my house now and had never put together that that was th the same one. You know, a lot of those paintings were sold. We, my parents moved into a, a much smaller house after this. Um, so it's just, it's just kind of a little silly fun fact. Uh, another kind of thing people usually ask is um, what, uh, do I, did I get to keep anything? Like, was I, did I get any souvenirs? You know, like, I mean, granted, if something like that happened now, I'd probably ask for a, one of kids' hubcaps or something. You know, like just a, some sort of movie prop thing. Uh, one of the cool things that I did get that I, I, I shockingly still have all these years later is this, okay? And this is actually, this is not just a crew hat. Uh, it doesn't fit me because I have a giant head. This is actually Hoff's crew hat. And I have a picture in here. Here he is actually giving me th that hat. And I just treasured that thing. I mean, I wore that hat with pride everywhere. You can see now, I mean, it's still in pretty good shape. Uh, I mean, the inside's kind of worn out with age, but all the, uh, all the tabs on the back are, are broken off for me resizing it. And, you know, from my little kid head to my giant adult head. And another thing I got to keep is this, which is a 1984 <laughs> autographed uh, publicity shot of Hoff and Kit. 
And finally, sort of the last thing that's kind of cool, I have the entire, entire one, but it's in storage. Uh, they, I have a copy of the shooting script. And for some reason, there's this little, this little second, smaller part of it. But yeah, so they, I have a whole copy of the shooting script as well. Uh, I couldn't find it though for the, this recording. It's, it's deep in storage. Here's a, uh, a newspaper article, you know, with the location scout talking about how she found the perfect house in Tiburon for Knight Rider. It's funny, that house, last time I drove by it about two years ago, uh, it's totally unchanged. It's, it's exactly the same, like exactly the same, which is kind of nice as someone who is, uh, you know, a bit more on the sentimental side. There's another article, TV filming moves to the North Bay with Kit. I have so many photos, I should actually scan these and throw them up on, on my, uh, my Instagram one day. Here's another good shot of, uh, this is another one, good shot of Hoff just kind of goofing around with me, like just really hamming it up for my, my ridiculous photo requests. And that's kind of all. I've, uh, I love talking about it. It was a great, great time in my life. Knight Rider sort of becoming this cultural icon it has. It's always a great way to start a conversation. You know, it, it, there's no one my age that doesn't know the show. And I've never found anyone who has said, you know, oh, I didn't like that show. And so it's always kind of a fun conversation starter. It's fun to talk about. It's fun to be sentimental about. And, uh, as far as, um, now my relationship with Knight Rider, I still love it. I have a very small collection of stuff. And I think because when something like that happens as a kid, every birthday and Christmas for like two to three years afterwards, I got bombarded with just Knight Rider stuff. So as far as like a collection, you've kind of just really seen it. Um, I have the hat, the photo, I have the the talking Kenner uh, kit car. There's very little stuff. So more of my, my collection for Knight Rider is more kind of in my memories than in this photo album. And, uh, with that, I'm going to say goodbye. I know it's only November, but um, a little preemptively, I would like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. How 80s is that for a Christmas card? Uh, me, me with David Hasselhoff. <laughs> right. I hope, hope you've been, enjoyed this, and uh, thank you for having me. Production 58621, Night of the Drones. This episode was written by Robert Foster and Gerald Sanford. It was directed by Sidney Hayers. This episode originally aired on NBC September 30th, 1984 at 8 p.m. That was a Sunday. It was the season three premiere. It was the 43rd episode to air, but the 47th to be produced. That's right. They actually filmed Kit vs. Car, Lost Night, Night in Disgrace, and The Ice Bandits all before they filmed Night of the Drones. And that's actually going to help us explain away some of the inconsistencies that we're going to see here in this episode. The synopsis reads as follows. Kit is destroyed while on a mission to San Francisco to investigate Bonnie's mentor. All right, so with that, let's begin. Okay, so this episode is unique in that it opens with a teaser almost right i uh the episode actually begins before the opening intro that's something that's extremely common in television these days but back in 1984 that was kind of a rarity right they always started the show they had the 30 second teaser showing what was coming up in the episode then they had the opening theme song and then they'd get into the episode but for this episode and this episode only they started with um, a montage of Kit driving and then C.J. Jackson being broken out of prison and then um, then they cut to the intro. It was actually a pretty nice little mini cliffhanger, if you will. But one of the first things, scenes we see is, again, this montage of Kit driving. This is actually a scene going all the way back to the pilot presentation. This is the John Ward-styled front nose uh, on one of the original three Kit cars that was... Um, procured for filming that 20 minute pilot presentation so if you look closely here you can see it doesn't have the normal kit nose we've got the elongated hood and the flat stock style front nose we now move ahead to this establishing shot of the santa clara penitentiary where we see cj jackson being incarcerated and this is where he escapes we also see this um, opening shot at the beginning of kitnap as well 
but um, this is actually San Francisco jail number five in San Bruno, California. So it was at the time a real uh, jail. Unfortunately, this building was torn down sometime in the last, I'd say 10 years, 10 or 15 years. And um, so take a look at this building. You'll see it's very unique. It's very long. It's got this center section with a, a uh, piece that juts out in the middle. So let's take a look. Here's some satellite information. So we can see here, here's that scene. Here's what it looked like. Um, obviously, even in this aerial scene from, I think, 2009, it was in quite a bit of disrepair, as you can see. So that drone car broke through a fence over here and drove through and... This is where CJ escaped from. But if we zoom out and we look at the today shot, we can see that that building is no longer here. In fact, you see this um, tank right here, and you can see that this building right here, and if we look, you can compare. These are the same, but unfortunately, that building has been raised. So another Knight Rider location lost. All right, and then, of course, we've got CJ Jackson played by, of course, Jim Brown. Now, Jim Brown was an extremely famous NFL football player for the Cleveland Browns, widely considered one of the best running backs of all time. But here he is doing an excellent job as uh, inmate uh, C.J. Jackson here in Night of the Drones. So let's take a minute and appreciate this awesome drone radio that was built, this, that the prop department built. Um, you can see it here. Obviously, it's an extreme custom job. Um, the radio probably wasn't that thick, but this radio actually lit up the screen lit up It actually unfolded. I mean it did all that stuff in later scenes. You can see a wire um, That controlled all the special effects, but this is an uh, a donor boom box that at least the front panel is I think what they did is they just put this front panel from the donor boom box and placed it on here um, This is a an extremely rare uh, Japanese boom box um, in all my years, I've yet to find uh, an actual example of it, but um, I have seen pictures, but uh, they're extremely hard to find. And if you think about it, I mean, just watching the scene, it is pretty amazing what this thing can do. I mean, all via remote control, it unfolds, the head flips up, the, the arms extend out from the sides, and the legs lift up, and the top can the top can twist 180 degrees, and you can just barely see right here um, part of the wire or hose that was behind here that controlled a lot of that stuff. But still, just a fascinating piece of engineering. All right, so now at this point, C.J. Jackson has escaped with the help of the Ford Thunderbird drone car, and uh, if you look here in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see one of the mounts for the camera there. But this is this is the end of the the pre-intro scene that I was talking about earlier, as most of you know. Now, um, when this episode went into syndication, it was cut into two parts. Um, unfortunately, the two-hour episode suffered the most whenever um, they went into syndication because there was a lot of um, footage cut. And that includes this setup here where we have this opening um, teaser, if you will. Um, in syndication, it starts, the episode actually starts just with the introduction, the, the opening theme. And then after the theme, it comes in, it shows this bit, and then it cuts to the, the uh, title screen, Night of the Drones, and continues on. So really, besides the NBC version, and then when we finally got this on DVD and Blu-ray, and we were able to, to see this uh, restored back to the way it was always intended. Okay, so now let's take a sidebar and let's talk about the very unique opening intro for Night of the Drones. So for Night of the Drones only, and only for the original NBC airing, there was a very special and unique opening intro. The team behind the show wanted to make sure that none of the new features that Kit would get in this episode, his new dashboard and any of the other um, new gadgets, were not spoiled in the opening credits. So what we did is we put together the original NBC version of the intro down below and then the regular season three intro above. And we'll pause it as we go along and we'll show you the differences. Now, I'm sorry, we're not allowed to play the actual theme music, so you're just going to have to settle for my voice. But you can see right here. All right, so right at the beginning, um, we still have the season two style 
a lot of the season two style credits. Here it, it gives a close up of the tail light. Up here it transitions to his new dashboard. And you can see here it just kind of goes off on its own. We see the new dashboard versus the old dashboard here. And then we move forward, we still see the pilot scene here. And then this is the same scene, but if you look, the new version for season three has Kit's new monitor frame, where this old version still has the original pilot TV frame. Let me zoom in. We get the two versions of the turbo boost buttons, but then we cut and now we're back to season three footage. So really this drone's intro is a hybrid of the season two and season three intro. So we can see here, this is all exactly the same. There we have a different version of the voice box. And notice that they did show the countdown. They did show the season three countdown in this Night of the Drone. So I f they figured that that probably wasn't something to be spoiled. So here we still have all the same footage. A lot of the center, the center of the, the intro is pretty much the same, except right here. So let me back up just a hair here. So you can see here, um, instead of this close up of the dash, they have the original pilot dash and then new speedometer versus old speedometer but then it cuts over to the season three um, clips. So very much, like I said, a hybrid of season one, of uh, season two versus season three intros, but it's still neat. There we go. There's pursuit, the differences of the pursuit lights. And then we have the season three pulling into the semi. And then again, new monitor frame versus old monitor frame. Cut here, old speedometer versus new speedometer. Look at that, they almost even got the same digits, 112 versus 109. Kit's voice, close up of Kit's voice. A little different there, and then it finishes the same. So like I said, that intro was not seen. So like I said, so like I said, this version of the intro hasn't been seen on any of the subsequent releases. The DVD or the Blu-ray all put in the season three intro. As far as we know, only the original NBC airing had this unique version of the intro. So there you go, the more you know. All right, so this seems like a good a time as any to talk about the various cars used in this episode. Now, this episode, marks the debut of the brand new hero car. So as we've, we've kind of talked about this a little bit in the past, but season one and season two had a specific hero car, right? So for season three, whenever they overhauled kit, they didn't simply take the original hero car, pull the dash out, put the new style dash in that we see debuted in this episode. They actually took an entirely different Trans Am and converted it into the hero car. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, this is the brand new season three and four hero car. It would be used as the hero car until the rest of the series. This car actually debuted way back in season one in Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death as kind of a general purpose stunt car. In fact, some of you might remember those episodes around that, um, a nice and decent little town, Topaz Connection. You would see every once in a while scenes with a Trans Am that had tan leather interior as opposed to the fabric Perella cloth interior. Anytime you saw that leather interior, that was actually what would become this season three and four hero car. Um, this is luckily one of the five cars that has survived to this day. It is currently not in the United States. It's the only one not in the United States, but um, we had the opportunity to see it a few years ago and document it and, um, and uh, confirmed its uh, authenticity. So uh, hopefully one day we'll be able to do a full story on this particular car. So then we see this is, again, the same car. He's just rounding a bend and we see the new dashboard inside. So this is probably one of the most common um, catches, um, mistakes in this episode. You know, how does Kit already have his new one TV dashboard early in the episode before he's destroyed? Well, the answer is simple. Um, remember, this episode was the fifth one to be filmed for season three. So by this point in the series, they no longer had the original hero car in its original configuration with the two TV dash in it. It was, 
that that hero car had been um, gutted and turned into the right-hand blind drive car, which we'll get into later. I don't want to confuse everyone. So what they did is they took that 2TV hero dash out of the hero car and they put it in the left-hand blind drive car where it would stay for the rest of the series. So they really didn't have a full proper hero car to film these scenes other than the one TV dash. And that's why um, you see what you see here. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, and moving forward, this also marks the debut of a brand new insert car. So as, as you probably know, if you've been following along last season, the insert car that they used was season one's back up to the hero car, which is the car that we own. So starting in uh, season three, they use a brand new Trans Am for the insert car. Now, as far as we can tell, this Trans Am has never been used on the series prior. It was a new acquisition for season three. And interestingly enough, this would only be the insert car for season three. In season four, they got yet another new car to use for the insert shots. A um, couple ways you can tell that this car is different and newer is um, we've got a split style rear back seat, which we'll show you here in an upcoming uh, screenshot. And um, there's a couple other little details. This is a 1984 model car. It was the first 1984 model uh, Trans Am used in the show. And um, just other little things. You'll see there's some holes here in the, in the uh, B pillar. And interestingly enough, this, w all, this was also the only car that had a working auto roof. And we see it working a couple episodes later in Knights of the Fast Lane. But... This car, for a few episodes at the beginning of Season 3, actually had a working auto roof, which is kind of cool. All right, so let's move on. All right, so here we've got uh, David Halston, Margot Sheridan, and is that Clifton or Turk? I don't know, one of the Barbarian brothers, which we'll also get into later. In the background, we've got uh, a piece rented from Modern Props. This is the same shape of the boomerang unit that we see in the semi, but with different electronics in the front. And we've got a drone car here, and if you look, they put like this film over the windshield to make it appear that the car had blacked out windows, when in reality it was just some film that they applied. Um, something that you don't realize, and, and I don't think I really realized until much later, um, the script, the original script, noted that David Holston built three of these drone cars. Well, you watch the episode and you're like, well, I only see two, right? But... Think about this. Remember the upcoming chase scene where Michael chases the drone car, it skids out, and then he stops, opens the door. And later on in the episode, he has the CPU from the drone car. So they are, the foundation actually commandeered that drone car, right? But later in the episode, David Halston has two drone cars that he uses to try and attack Michael and Kit. So there's your three cars. So there actually were three drone car supposedly in reality for filming this episode they only had two Ford Thunderbirds but um, story-wise they're supposed to be three and an interesting note one of these drone cars reappears in season four's Night Racer all right so this is also the debut of um, some new graphics that they use on kits monitors a lot of these wireframe graphics right we hadn't really seen these prior in prior to this episode in the series but um, starting in this episode, and really to the end of the, the uh, series, we see a lot of these wireframe uh, type uh, graphics, which I think are really cool. And somewhere in my vast archives, I actually have information about the company that did these graphics. Um, and I think, I can't find it for this video, but I think what I'm going to do is, if you guys are interested, I'm going to reach out to um, some of the... You know, obviously, the company's not around anymore, but I know the names. And maybe I'll reach out to them, see if we can get an interview, and have them talk about the process of designing Kit's graphics starting in Season 3. So here's what I was saying. See how Kit ha now has these split rear back seats? This is the first episode where we see these split seats. In previous uh, seasons, it was always the solid rear back seat. So that tells us... Um, uh, that uh, this is definitely not an 82 Trans Am because they didn't offer the split seats in 82. So it's a, a definitely a newer version. Um, but interestingly enough, 
these rear speed seats are recovered in the Pirella cloth, which was a 1982 only fabric. You couldn't get these split rear seats with Pirella cloth. So those were recovered to match the PMD seats. Um, and also you see this overhead console, you see, you can't see it too well, but you see how it just sits right at the bottom of this headliner. That's because they had to have it lower to fit in the auto roof mechanism I was talking about earlier. But again, let's get into the auto roof mechanism in Knights of the Fast Lane when we can actually see it working. So much like with the season one premiere and the competition is no competition ad campaign, and the season two kit kit campaign season three also had a promo to tie in with the start of the new season it was the 1900 210 kitt promo so in the weeks leading up to the debut of night of the drones there was a commercial that aired with hasselhoff and kit talking about kit's new features for the upcoming season if you wanted to learn more they gave a phone number you could call so Many people have seen the commercial. It's been on YouTube for a long time. We're gonna show that to you now. But after that, we're actually gonna play for you the original audio recording that someone would hear if they would have called that number back in 1984. It's amazing that this audio file still exists. So enjoy. Thinking about a new car? And check out 1985's Car of the Year. This year, Kit has more amazing features and more incredible powers than ever. And September 30th, you can see them all. I can't wait. If you can't wait, call 1-900-210-KITT and find out more. Michael? Easy, buddy. More about Kit for 1985? I can't wait. If you can't wait, call 1-900-210-KITT and you'll find out about America's hottest driving machine. And this season, Michael will be driving the hottest car ever seen on television, me. I have new superpowers like 3D video screens and an audio synthesizer, plus a laser seat belt guaranteed to keep Michael in his place, special wheels that will help me drive anywhere, and a new laser shield system that even Michael's knack for trouble can't penetrate. And there's even more. So let's all be there for the special two-hour Night Rider movie premiere on Sunday, September 30th, and thanks for calling. All right. So you heard me say that they didn't have the season two hero car to film some of those scenes. But then, of course, you see this. This is during the chase in San Francisco. And um, obviously, this is the origin, the season two hero dash. At this point in the, in the series, though, this dash is no longer in the hero car. This is actually the left-hand blind drive car we're looking at. But they have the frame set up in such a way that you can't see... A lot of the like like the um the left hand blind drive car had a large rats ratchet style shifter and that's just out of frame and you know other little details so they framed this so it looked like they still had the hero car but in reality the hero car had already been converted into the right hand blind drive car and speaking of this chase in san francisco let's take just a sidebar because a number of years ago we mapped out this entire chase scene and uh, with then and now shots and an, a map overlay so let's just take one minute let's look at a little montage of the then and now shots for this entire bullet inspired chase through the streets of san francisco
and in what might be his most prominent role in the series, uh, where he gets the most screen time, this is Harold Halfrizzle, part of the Knight Rider crew. Uh, he wins an award for the most cameos throughout Knight Rider. He's been in a million background scenes in the show, but here he gets to be front and center. Well deserved. All right, so did you ever notice during this chase scene that uh, the cab actually hits the rear quarter of Kit right there? Um, you watch the scene and Kit kind of goes off frame, but clearly he hits that rear quarter. Interestingly, one of the uh, the original that we have had heavy damage back in that rear quarter. In fact, it's filled with about 50 rivets and a ton of body filler, but it's not this car, unfortunately. All right, so I'm going to be honest with you. This car is a bit of a mystery. We've been trying to figure it out. So this is obviously a Trans Am, but take a look at that front nose. We've got a stock 82 through 84 Trans Am bumper with the scanner cut out and with the grills missing and fog lights in its place. So what's going on with this car? One of the, one of the things that makes this a real mystery is the fact that this car appears to be outfitted with high traction drop downs. You can see it there. Let's go back a scene. Look at the gap there. Look at the gap there. Only two cars were built for speed demons that had the high traction drop downs. One was the manual transmission stunt car and two was the insert car that we currently own. Now, the manual transmission stunt car would become, the, they would gut it for Junkyard Dog and throw it in the acid pit, right? But we have, this car will appear throughout season three all the way through the end of season three through Night Strike after they filmed Junkyard Dog. So what does that tell us, right? That tells us that this can't be the manual transmission stunt car because they're still using this car in this configuration after it was already gutted, the engine was pulled out um, for Junkyard Dog. So that begs the question, is this our insert car? Now we know our insert car had a proper style Knight Rider front nose for all of season one and all of season two. But for season three, the car kind of, um, the, our insert car really barely gets used at all to our knowledge but of course that begs the question is this our insert car and maybe maybe they took the bumper off and needed it for something else for some reason and they just threw this one on the front just for a quick drive-by stunt car i don't know i'm hoping that one day we can answer that and the answer is going to be in hopefully the call sheets for this episode the call sheets list which cars we're on scene for which days, and we're hoping that one day we get our hands on uh, the call sheets for some of these scenes, either in this episode or in the other episodes in Season 3 that feature this car. And if we see our car number, because all the cars were numbered from the studio, if we see our car number on those call sheets, that's probably our confirmation that this is, in fact, our insert car. But to this day, this car remains a mystery to us. So we'll point it out and throughout the season three. By season four, it's gone. Um, so, uh, or at least it, it's gone with its stock front nose, right? So uh, more to come on this car. But this is this is one of our one of the Night Rider historians' big mysteries. We hope to solve one day soon. So here we have David and Peter Paul, the Barbarian Brothers, professional uh, bodybuilders. Um, rose to quite a bit of fame in the 80s. They even had um, a couple movies and whatnot. Unfortunately, David Paul, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know which one is David and which one's Peter, but David died back in 2020 in his sleep. Um, but uh, it's certainly a memorable role here. And once again, there's the season three and four dash before Kit has been destroyed in this episode. Ooh, a blank tape sale. And once again, 
something else big to talk about in this episode, the return of Patricia McPherson, something that David Hasselhoff and Edward Mulher really lobbied the producers for. Not that they didn't love Rebecca Holden, and Rebecca was certainly um, a welcome addition to the show, but um, Patricia uh, has a much welcomed return in this episode. Um, in fact, there was actually a scene written for this episode that was not filmed. It was a reunion scene between Bonnie and Kit where Bonnie specifically mentions April, which I think would have been cool. And in the scene, Kit tells Bonnie that it just wasn't the same without her around. Um, Kit opens his door. She gets in. Bonnie comments, I see April kept you in top shape. And Kit replies, yes, but now she's in accept now she's accepted an offer with a French firm. It's hard to find good help these days. So I think that would have been a nice way to to tie it all together without, you know, just April just up and disappearing. And in the background, we've got yet another cool um, modern props piece of blinky lights. And then there's this scene where um, David throws Patri to Patricia the CPU unit and she catches it very gingerly and looks back at his eyes. This was actually a little bit of a, a real reaction by Patricia because during the filming of this episode, she um, was practicing for her part in NBC's Circus of the Stars and um, her hands were quite tender from all of that practicing that she was doing. So um, the reaction on her face is actually real. So in the background here, we have a Texas Instruments professional computer. This is the exact same style computer that's in the semi. In fact, this might just be the very same one um, that they pulled out of there just to place here. I'm not sure. Although actually, you know what? I don't think it is now that I look at this because the one in the semi, they added extra Texas Instruments logos all over it for product placement. And this one does not appear to have those extra logos. So this was apparently a different unit. And we see Devin grabbing his ear. And if you remember all the way back in one of our first commentaries, we saw him do this. And I mentioned that that was Edward Mulhair's way of saying hello to his family and friends across the world. He would grab and tug at his ear. And we'll see that a couple more times in the series. Here we have Michael arriving in Chinatown. Um, back in 2008, I had the opportunity to, I was in San Francisco. So, of course, I just had to go to Chinatown, right? So uh, I thought I'd show you a couple of those pictures. So here's Fong's China Trader restaurant then. And there it is in 2008, New Tech Entertainment. All right. And then, so Kit was parked right here. The taxi comes up behind them. See this pole right here? I wanted to park there, but this van was there. But there's that same pole right there. I know. I need to get a life. All right. So Michael's now fight fighting... Um, in Fong's China Trader restaurant. And I always found this scene really funny. He's fighting with them. There's no like background action music playing. It's just fighting and grunts and kicks and um, all that stuff. And then he picks up and he throws this butcher knife and he looks back and that's where it landed. And I just thought, oh, that's interesting. And when I used to, when I first watched this, I thought, oh, it landed like right between the legs of this chicken. But no, it's actually between two heads of a chicken. So still humorous as an adult. All right, so this scene is uh, where the two guys are attacking Kit because Kit insulted them in Chinese. This is the left-hand blind drive car. So you can't see it, but obviously um, the Hero Dash is now in this car. In season two, when this car debuted, it just had a shell of a dash with nothing on it. But now they moved the um, hero dash into this car. So throughout the rest of the series, anytime you spot the season two dash, you know it's the left-hand blind drive car. And again, there's the season three hero car. All right, I'm done pointing that out. You get the, you get the idea. All right, so here is the debut of the right-hand blind drive car. Previously, this was the hero car. So um, this car will be used as a right-hand blind drive car throughout the rest of the series. And much like the Season 3-4 Hero car, this car still survives as well. In fact, it was part of our uh, 2017 picture car reunion. And here you can see when we move ahead, you can see the, um, 
the baggage behind the uh, the passenger side seat. You can see the the shroud where the stuntman is driving. So this was actually pretty ingenious. And this car was built. Um, the right hand drive was built by George Barris and his uh, crew. Um, there was a small steering wheel on this side. They added uh, throttle and brake pedals. The brake pedal were connected by um, heavy duty cables that ran out underneath the car around the front of, of the car, all still underneath, and then back to the factory um, driver's side brake pedal. So whenever um, the stunt guy would hit the brake pedal on the passenger side, it would actually activate the brake pedal on the driver's side, which would then engage the brake booster and stop the car. Um, and then the throttle was, you know, obviously pulled in and, and tied to the carburetor. Um, and then they had a series of sprockets and chains that connected the steering column that they added on the right-hand side to the factory steering column on the left-hand side. So it was pretty ingenious the way it all came together and seemed to work really well. And one of the neat things that they tried um, in these early episodes with the right-hand blind drive car is to have Kit pull up, Michael gets in, and drives off all without the scene cutting. Now, we don't see that in this specific scene I'm showing you here, but um, in the Ice Bandits which the Ice Bandits was actually the first episode filmed that featured the right-hand blind drive car because it was filmed before this episode, as you know now. Um, and uh, they they do that in that. They, they have Kit uh, pull up, Michael gets in, and drives off all without cutting the scene. So they do that twice in that episode. So it was neat. They didn't continue doing that, but uh, that was kind of the idea behind it. And we have the uh, premiere, the debut of the passive laser restraint system. This um, was added because of concerns. This was added because of concerns related to uh, depicting Michael never having a seatbelt on in the first two seasons. So they didn't want to actually add seatbelts to the car. So they instead invented these laser restraints. Um, and, uh, you know, they even make a point, uh, Kit says, make sure you have your laser restraint system on. And Michael says, I wouldn't drive without it. And we see this. This obviously wasn't a feature added when Kit was destroyed in this episode. He had it previously, as we can see here. Here's the Powell and Mason cable car and uh, still in operation today. So looking in the background here, this is back at the... Um, house in Tiburon, California, the same one you heard earlier, um, Tyler Ham talking about. And um, I asked him specifically, you know, why is there plastic over the windows? To see if he had any memories of that. He didn't have memories of it, but his guess is probably the correct one. And that was to diffuse a lot of the natural light coming in. So it wouldn't kind of uh, drown out the actors. I think that's exactly what it was. And as if this wasn't enough, the debut of the new foundation semi-tractor. The same 1984 GMC General we are currently restoring. Here is our first episode uh, where it is featured. They replaced the previous GMC General, which was a 1980 model. They replaced it simply because um, the product placement firm had a contract with GMC and a relationship with Universe Studios, and they simply wanted the the newest and latest and greatest products to be shown on the hot television shows of the day. Knight Rider was certainly a hot television show, so they wanted a brand new GMC General to be depicted. Even though when you look at it, it looks almost identical, you know, besides the sleeper, um, to the previous one. They still wanted brand new uh, GMC General on the show, and that's how this one came to be. And if you want to know the whole story about how we found it sitting in a field in Idaho, for 15 years. Uh, check out the videos on our channel and you'll learn all about it. We have a whole series on the restoration of the semi and by the time we are done, it is going to look exactly like you see here. The entire episode, this entire episode was filmed obviously in San Francisco, except for the scenes we see in the semi. Those ones were filmed on stage one at Universal Studios. Um, and this is normal for all of the season premieres that take place elsewhere. Goliath in Las Vegas, Night of the Juggernaut in Chicago. But really, this episode films in their destination location more than every other episode. There's actually scenes in Night of the Juggernaut, like where Kit was destroyed, that actually were filmed in Los Angeles when they were supposed to be Chicago. Same with things like Las Vegas. But here, pretty much every single scene was San Francisco except for the semi-interiors and probably David Halston's um, The Bank Vault.
And whoever was in charge of the stock footage for this episode did a terrible job considering Knight Rider is a kid's show. And then you've got things like this going on. So now we have Michael approaching the rendezvous spot where he will, well, Kit will ultimately uh, be destroyed here. And we get the close-up of the drone car opening. This was obviously just a uh, panel that was not on the actual car. It was an insert shot. But here we have uh, the turbo boost. Michael lands. We've got a Knight Rider crew member back here. You can see he's even wearing a Knight Rider hat. And then Kit's destroyed. And, of course, it uh, cuts to a miniature, right? So I believe they only had one or two of the miniature models that had the T-top that opens. This car is still around. Um, well, pretty much all the models are still around. But um... So Kit's on his side, uh, full of damage. What car is this, you might ask? I don't really know. Um, we can see a couple details here. It appears to be a Firebird, not a Trans Am, because there's no fender flares here. It does look like there's a bolt right there through the center hubcap. And the only car we ever saw having a bolt through it was the roll cage acrylic window jump car. But not sure that that's what this car is. But they did a good job of covering the underside up and throwing some wires under there. Um, let's move ahead here. But we really don't get to see too much of this car, unfortunately. But then when we move ahead and we see this, this is a completely different car. This is actually one of the general purpose T-top stunt cars that would be used, this car specifically would be used heavily throughout the rest of the series. And it's also the only car that had tan colored A-pillar trims. And we'll get over that in a second. So obviously here, this is the insert shot of the um, insert dash on the stage. They plucked out some wires to you know give Kit this, this uh, look on his voice box here. But you see when we zoom ahead, we see there's no overhead console, but we can see the tan A-pillars. This is something that this car would have throughout most of Season 3. And in fact, this car would be used as car, Night Automator Roving Robot, in Kit versus Car. And um, one way you can easily tell this car, at least in the first half of Season 3, are these tan A-pillars, which was not a factory option. What they did, my guess was... When this car came in and they were converting it to kit, it probably had a different color interior and they spray bombed it tan. And when they did that, they spray bombed these A pillars too, not realizing that they should have stayed black. And we can see the soot they put on the headliner here. If you look right here, it almost looks like this car was a white or a silver originally. And here's one of the rare times we see the back brake room in the semi. This obviously debuted um, a year prior in the Goliath season premiere but uh, again one of the few times we see it um, we'll see it again in Night and Nerd and maybe a couple other times and once again here we've got the plastic on the windows again most likely because of the glare and here's the just a room full if you're a modern props fan this is you're just salivating with all this stuff um, is this the palm printer right here that we see in Night of the Juggernaut it might be. You know the scene where Devin puts his hand here and then it reads across here? We'll have to compare that. Um, also, this uh, standalone computer terminal right here. So we see this heavily throughout Season 3 and Season 4. I don't think... Was this in Season 2? I don't think it was. I think this is a new addition from Modern Props to um, the semi-set for Seasons 3 and 4. So now we have the official debut of the Dash in the Hero car. So you might be wondering, well, what was the functionality on the, the Dash that was actually in this car? Because we see Michael turns the key, and it applies power, and it lights up. So we're not 100% sure. We do know that they had the ability to scale up and down these values. My guess is it was similar to the original Michael Chaffee Dash in terms of function functionality, where... Nothing was necessarily tied to the car's functions, but there was probably a control box in the trunk that allowed them to scale up and down all these values. We do see in this scene Michael presses buttons on the, the switch pod, and they react, right? So he presses the button, these light up or turn off. Because we own the insert dash and we have one of these original panels, we know that these buttons in the center were just push on, push off, um, latching switches. So there was no way, at least on the insert dash, to turn on and off 
this left bank. This left bank was always on and these were just on off with the latches. And we do see in Night in Disgrace that this actually is a working TV um, and they will use it as a working TV. But later on in the series, they'd replace it with just a piece of like white, um, not cardboard, but pl a, a fake screen, which you can see, because they would then just superimpose the images over that. They wouldn't need a real TV. And I always thought this was a neat callback during the scene where Kit's uh, playing back all these different sounds. One of the sounds he plays back is Goliath's growl, right? So Kit obviously recorded that from Goliath or Goliath Returns. I thought that was a neat Easter egg. And another new debut. This is the debut of the new insert dash. So for those of you not familiar, the insert dash was never in a car during filming of the series. It always sat on a soundstage and was used for all the close-ups uh, of Kit's dash in his voice box. So, and many of you know this from watching our channel, we actually also own this insert dash, right? So we could almost just recreate Night of the Drones at this point. Um, so it's currently undergoing a restoration that's quite an undertaking. So check out the videos on our channel if you want to see where we're at with that project. And also the debut of the lighted gas pedal, right? Um, so was this in a car? The answer is, I think so. I think, but I don't think it was in a complete car. I think they had a buck, right? Just a, um, a cockpit for some of these shots. That's my guess. I don't know for sure. But remember, at this point, they had an ample supply of vehicles from the train wreck. So my guess is that this was probably a wreck Trans Am, and they, they took the, the center section, the, the passenger compartment, and um, used it for insert shots like this. And once again, here is the right-hand blind drive car. In later episodes and seasons, this passenger seat sits way up, almost to the to the roof. But here, it's really, really down low. So I'd imagine it was probably hard for the stunt guys to see out of the car at this um, level. And we never did cover this, but let's talk about how many cars, how many kits were used in this episode. They actually used nine different Trans Ams in this episode. We have the hero car, the new hero car this car the right hand blind drive car we still have the hard top stunt car we've got the the t-top stunt car the one that we saw uh, with the t-top off right after kit was destroyed being um, winched into the semi we've got the left hand blind drive car which i showed you earlier we've got the new insert car we've got uh, the kit that they had on its side after it was destroyed We've got another kit car used for the ski mode at the end of this episode, and we have the stock nose kit, which we also covered. So um, I think this is probably, the up to this point in the series, this is the most number of Trans Ams used in a single episode. All right, and speaking of stock nose kit, let's go back to this. There's this other scene where you get an even better look at this front nose here. Um, Again, this car was used with this configuration in season three, I don't know, five or six times, and we'll point it out each time. But um, in later episodes in season three, they actually put a metal frame around here. So this hollow area on both sides is covered, and it's just a, a cutout for the uh, fog lights. All right, so then let's talk about uh, this prop here. This is actually a toy from Star Wars Return of the Jedi. And it's been kind of doctored up. But that's, if you want to buy this gun, you still can on eBay. And the award for the most overacted death scene definitely goes to Jim Brown here. I always thought this, even as a kid, that this was a little hokey. So David Halston shoots him in the stomach. He grabs real stiff, turns around, and then just drops. And it was just very, um, his movements were very, you know, one, two, three, down, right? It's not at all as I would imagine how you'd react if you got shot in the abdomen. But I don't know. I've never been shot in the abdomen. Maybe some of you out there have, and you can tell me if that's a normal reaction. Anyways. I'm sorry. I just have to point out this beautiful semi. And this is a great scene with Kit coming out of the back and then driving past. And uh, one day, one day we're going to be able to recreate this scene. Maybe not in San Francisco. One day we'll re recreate this scene. All right, and then we've got uh, Bonnie and David and Margot and Getaway. These are all, again, um, modern props pieces. 
This is the very same suitcase that Boyd LaSalle uses in Night in Disgrace to show that he's spying on the Foundation. And then, of course, we get some great Easter eggs on uh, the, not really Easter eggs, just little bits on whenever you watch. So on the episode, this data is just scrolling by really fast. Um, and let's see what we have here. Uh, any interesting names? Ha, huh, so get this. I just noticed this right now. See Eric Vesper? We interviewed Eric Vesper. He's a real guy. He's He was on the insert crew for Knight Rider. We interviewed him, I don't know, six months ago. And there's his name right there. I never noticed that. I wonder if these other names are are uh, part of the insert crew as well. Eric Vesper. There we go. I'm going to send this to him. Uh, who else do we have? John Sitcom. Phil Moritz. I don't recognize any of these other names. Bruce Golsky. But see, then you get down further, and um, then it goes print, 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 and then look, what the heck, the jury decision to deny Mayor Smith his choice of, and then it cuts off. So it was just a bunch of gibberish, but the fact that Eric Vesper's on there is awesome. All right, and then we have uh, the first ski mode of the new season right here, Olive's Bar and Grill. And again, this is a different Trans Am than all the other ones used in the episode so far, and of course they superimpose these uh, red hot missiles right there. And then Kit stops them. This is, of course, not David Halston, but a stunt guy. And we have Bonnie in a very rare uh, occasion of being in, not only being in driver's seat, but driving Kit, right? So last season we got to see April drive Kit a little bit. Now we get to see Bonnie drive Kit a little bit. All right, so is this the yellow Volkswagen Rabbit right there from last season? You tell me. And we have a very unique ending, right? We don't see Kit racing at us towards the desert. Instead, it's Kit on the San Francisco Bay Bridge. Oh, okay. Well, that's a lot of information, isn't it? <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, next time, we'll dig into the Ice Bandits. So if you stuck with me this long, thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. And now, while we listen to Joe's selection of Knight Rider music that we received directly from Don Peak himself, we'd like to thank these Patreon supporters. Look at you guys scrolling up the screen to my right. Wait a minute, how can you tell which side is my right since you can't see me because I'm not on camera? Oh well, you know what I mean. We are featuring these fine supporters at our Knight Rider prop restorer level. Thank you very much for your support. And for those of you at the Knight Rider History Hunter level, we're recognizing you right now in the description. Now, if you enjoyed seeing this golden nugget of Knight Rider history being rescued from obscurity, then please consider supporting us on Patreon. Your support would empower us to bring you even more of these historical nuggets. We are the Knight Rider Historians. Till next time, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.